it's really a pleasure to be here at this interesting uh, workshop. So I'm going to discuss about uh, metastability for global dynamics uh, with inhomogeneous coupling disorder. My talk is going to be a continuation of the talk by Frank, but it's also self-contained, so don't worry if you, if you were not uh, the, there this morning. Um, okay, so uh, this is a joint work in collaboration with uh, Anton Bovier from Bonn, uh, Frank, Saeda Marello also from Bonn, and Martin Zlovic from Mannheim. By the way, can you hear me also in the back? Yes? Okay, um, okay so uh, the first slide is introductory. Uh, now we have seen, we have uh, seen a lot of talks dealing about metastability, <laughs> so this slide is going to be a bit... Uh, Again, maybe redundant, but I want to stress again the general picture here. So, um, as Frank also said, metastability is a very universal phenomenon. And what happens here is that we are observing a system which is evolving in time under the influence of a stochastic dynamics. And what we can observe is that it moves in different regions of its state space on different time scales. So we, we, we can uh, observe that there is a fast time scale where the system reach a quasi equilibrium within a single subregion. And then uh, we might think that the, the system is in equilibrium in this subregion, but then if we wait for a longer time, the, the system jumps uh, on an, in another subregion. So we, we, we can also observe that there is a slower time scale where we observe transitions between subregions. And now, um, if we observe what happens in physics, then we can say that actually metastability is the dynamical uh, manifestation of the presence of a first order phase transition. So again, as also Frank men mentioned, one can observe condensation, magnetization, and, uh, and, and one can study uh, metastability. Um, so now, um, we have also seen that a very important object to observe is the free energy of, of, uh, of, a, of a system. So it's true that metastability is a dynamical phenomenon, but we can already observe uh, um, what happens at equilibrium by observing the free energy. So uh, the free energy is, uh, is, um, is, a, is a function that uh, we, we can observe and we can look at some quantities of interest, such as, um, we can observe, we can fix some somehow uh, parameter regime such that this is give, giving us some multiple minima of the free energy. This is our interesting setting. Then we observe the critical points of F and we can see that there are local minima or our metastable states, then global mini, the global minimum which is our stable state and then in between we will see these saddle points or these local maxima. And then, of course, again, the, the object we are interesting, uh, interested in is the mean heating time. Because the point is that the system, which is subject to this stochastic dynamics, um, is going to take a very long time to go from the metastable to the stable state. But this time is also random, so we are interested in the, in the mean time. And uh, we are interested, again, in this Arrhenius law, which is telling us that the mean time is exponentially big in N, which is, say, the size of the system and number of particles, times the energy, the free energy barrier that the system has to overcome in order to do this transition. So this is the prototype example. We have seen it also many times. It's, it's double well uh, shape free energy, where this one is my metastable state and this one is stable. And this is, this delta F is the free energy barrier that the system has to uh, climb in order to, to, uh, to do the transition, hmm? to condensate. Or, so this one is a very simple uh, situation, and in general, we're going to have a much higher dimensional picture. So um, here I'm referring to two monographs, um, the one by Olivier and Vares and the one by Bovier and Denon Lander. And uh, their, their approach to metastability is different. So mm, the approach by Olivier and Vares is a pathwise approach, and the one uh, in the book by Anton and Frank is um, using potential theory. Uh, so we are going to, uh, to work in this uh, setting in the, with, with, with the help of potential theory, but I, I don't think I'm going to dive in, uh, in the methods, but more I, I aim at giving you an overview of what we managed to do. 
Okay, so now the problem is that we know that uh, physical systems are uh, microscopically very complicated. So it is very hard to describe them. What instead, what uh, one can easily do is to, um, to describe a mean field kind of model and at the expense of supposing that each component of the model interact with each other component with the same strength, disregarding on their position. This is, uh, this is very, uh, very, um, it's not very similar to real world, say, networks or real world systems. So our compromise is now to observe a kind of models which are dilute models. And let me introduce you these kind of dilute models. And again, we are in the, in the um, setting of the talk that Frank gave this morning, so we have spin models. So now, our model is going to be a mean field version of an easing type spin model with inhomogeneous bond disorder. So let's see what this means. Uh, we have n spins, simply, and um, our configuration space is the space of all possible spin configurations, uh, which are uh, these um, sequences of sigma i, where sigma i can only take two values, plus or minus one, which indicates spin up or spin down. So this is the usual setting. Um, so then you give me a configuration sigma, and then uh, the energy associated to this configuration is given by the, the, the Hamiltonian of the model. So now the model, sometimes I, I call it quench, sometimes I call it dilute. Um, here I, I, I try to, to, um, to replicate again the notation of Frank up to a certain slide, and then I think that I, I, I use another notation. So, but anyways, this is our, the Hamiltonian of our model. Um, so you see that this energy has um, an attractive two-body interaction where each pair of spins, sigma i and sigma j, interact with a certain coefficient, which is called jij. And then there is a linear term where each uh, single spin um, is subject to an external field, which is the magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field is constant and is supposed to, to h to be positive. Now, let me, let me explain why, I, why <laughs> there is this first uh, uh, sentence there. So it's a mean field version of an easing model because uh, I am here allowing every, sing every couple of spin, sigma i, and sigma j to interact with each other, like in a mean field model. In, when I do this, here in this uh, sum, I take order and square terms. Therefore, in, or in order for the energy to be linear in n, I have to, to, to divide by n. So this is the typical mean field uh, um, setting. But, oops, but I also allow the coefficients to be random. So this is where the dilution now is playing a role. So um, the, the, each sigma i and sigma j interact via uh, a, a, a coupling, uh, an interaction coefficient which is random. Therefore, I introduce a probability space and uh, these j and j are uh, sequences of random variables. Okay, so um, uh, now, um, up to here it's very similar to uh, Frank's talk, but now what I want to, to do is to say a few words about the choice of these random variables. The next slide is going to be a bit technical, but, um, but you will be rewarded afterwards. Um, so how do we choose JJ? So the point is that we are interested in doing a partial annealing of this model. This means that we want to take JJ to be random as a product of two different kinds of random variables, the A random variables and the B random variables. And it's going to be clear why we want to do that. Now, the choice of these sequences of random variable, it's a bit technical, okay? So th they have to satisfy some, uh, some uh, um, uh, constraint. In particular, they must be bounded, the bi must be mutually independent with each other, and independent from the a variables, while the a variables are also allowed to be dependent. 
Um, okay, so, um, and the expectation of the B variables is also random. Okay, so the expectation of the B are some P, I, J, which are also random variables between 0 and 1. Okay, so before uh, telling you why we are interested in this kind of model, let me emphasize now uh, what we have. We have three possible randomness levels. So one is the BIJ. The BIJ are random. Okay. Then their average is also random. Okay. All these averages are conditional averages with respect to sigma algebra, but um, I, see, I mean, I know that the, the, the audience is very broad, so I'm, I'm not going to go into technical details, okay? I will skip these technical details. So um, their expectation is also random. And the other uh, um, sequences of random variables A, uh, IJ will also play another uh, random uh, um, um, role, no? So we have all these three objects which are going to be random. Our results are going to be quenched in these two class, two sequences of random variables. Hmm? And, and I will explain why. Now, uh, again, the next uh, uh, question is why such a complicated model? And the reason is that um, there are uh, many examples that can be explained via this model. The first uh, class of models is the easing model on random graphs. So now, here I have just rewritten the Hamiltonian as before, so, so nothing has been done. Now, remember that the JJ is the product of A and B, and now choose A to be identically equal to 1, and the B to be a Bernoulli with a certain uh, mean, uh, say, PIJ. Okay, so I replace here the BIJ, and then you observe uh, that, yeah, here I have to sum over all the couple, but these BIJ are either zero or one. This means that I can bring the randomness in the sum in this way. I can sum now over all the possible um, edges, I and J, which belong to a certain, say, interaction graph, which is just telling me that I have an edge between i and j if and only if this random variable b is non-zero. Mm. So either you write uh, sum over all the couples with these random variables, or you say, because these are Bernoulli, either I have one or zero, you rewrite this sum as uh, uh, a sum over all the present edge. And the sum uh, and, and the, the underlying graph is now a kind of uh, Erdos-Schreni random graph. So what did I create here? So I, I created a model which is like an easing model, uh, model on a dense, inhomogeneous random graph. It's inhomogeneous because the probability that I put an edge depends on i and j. It's this p i j. Oh, now, examples within the example. Um, what happens if I put b equal to 1? Well, I just recover the complete graph. Right? I have all the possible links, and the easing model on the complete graph is simply the Curie-Weiss model. Now, uh, if instead I take the Bij to be Bernoulli with probability p, so fix, what I have is I have easing on the classical Erdos-Schreni random graph, right? where I put a link with probability p between uh, each couple of vertices, or I do not put uh, a link with probability 1 minus p fixed. Okay, and then one can, can get more um, um, da daring. <laughs> and for instance, uh, we can say that, okay, now other possibilities is, uh, is that the, 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 the U, uh, one possible inhomogeneous case is that the BIJ are distributed like Bernoulli with uh, um, mean VI, VI times VJ, where VI and VJ are two random variables, independent. Now, this case is called chung lu random graph. And it's one uh, other model that we are interested in. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is the big, one big class of, of models that we can, uh, that we can, that fall under our more abstract model. Mm, so easing on inhomogeneous random graphs. But then you, you might ask, uh, but then why did you introduce A if you take A equal to one? 
there is another class of models where A is also going to play a role. Uh, and this class of models are the Hopfield model. So uh, what is the Hopfield model? Um, the Hopfield model has been introduced in order to model um, neural networks, and in particular, associate memory. Um, so uh, it, it's again described in terms of spin models, but where the interaction between every couple of spins is modulated by a certain uh, um, scalar product of some uh, patterns. So these patterns are called the uh, uh, unit of memory. And what are they? They're sequences of uh, uh, vectors of dimension n, which are random. So uh, each, uh, each uh, psi i, k, is either one or minus one again. Okay, so uh, if you want to picture it, there is the way I, I see this model is that imagine that here you have your uh, chain of spins and on top of each sigma i, you have a column of size a little n of units of memory. Um, and the interaction between, say, this spin and this other spin depends on the scalar product of these two, uh, two vector, random vectors. Okay? Uh, this is the classical Hopfield model, which has been studied um, rigorously by many people, Anton Bovier, Veronique Gerard, Pierre Picot, uh, and, and many others. Um, and now, uh, what we want to, to also study within our class of models is this is a version of the Hopfield model which is diluted. So we would like to put this model on top of a random graph, say Erdos-Schreni. So what do we do? And now we are back to our previous uh, Hamiltonian. So say that this, um, the, the, the um, interaction coefficient of the classical Hopfield model is our AIJ. And notice that it's random. That's why we want the AIJ to be random. While the BIJ, um, for instance, for instance, um, for instance, think of that as Bernoulli with uh, with fixed parameter p to make it easier. But you can also consider them to be uh, more complicated random variables. Huh? So then the quenched Hamiltonian is again as before, where uh, this one is uh, is again this Bernoulli and the AIJ are this. Um, uh, scalar product of this uh, unit of memory, random objects. Okay. Uh, now that I have uh, um, introduced uh, the model and I gave you some example, I would like to, um, to, to introduce the annealed model. So our model is, is, is a quenched model that we would like to compare with something which is less random, in the, in the same spirit as Frank's talk this morning. Um, the point is that, um, and this was one of the, the final questions of uh, Frank, uh, is that one might be interested in uh, comparing your quench model with some model which is still random. So then you have to do something like a partial annealing. So this is exactly what we do here. So we average only uh, one of the two random variables, say the B random variables. Uh, so our annealed model is the one where I have partially uh, um, averaged out uh, one of the two random variables, the B ones. Okay. Why? Because we want to compare uh, models where, which are both random. And now, uh, again, let me give you uh, the same examples and we see uh, how they are related with each other. So if I look again at easing on Erdos-Schreni, which is one of the models that we can consider, the annealed version is Curivice, simply. Okay, because this one is one, and this one gives you the num a number. Um, and easing on Erdos-Schreni has been, uh, so the metastability of easing on Erdos-Schreni has been studied, studied by uh, Bovier, Marello, and myself, and uh, by Den Hollander and Jovanowski. Uh, but it also come as a byproduct from uh, from this uh, from this work uh, that I'm discussing now. Um, what about easing on Chung Li uh, Chung Lu random graph? Well, you um, you simply 
um, supposed BIJ are Bernoulli of the mean, the product of these uh, two random variables. And then when you average out, then you have something that is called easing with product disorder. So again, you have that each couple of spins interact with the product of the random variables, still random, still random. Um, and this uh, model has been studied by uh, Anton, Frank, and Saeda in uh, 2022. And uh, the, um, the quenched version is, um, is, is, is a byproduct of, of our result. And then uh, uh, for the, the dilute opfield, of course, the annealed version is the, the, the classical uh, opfield model studied by uh, Ander Eiden in 2007. And, and again, we, we study also this come as a result also from, from, this, uh, from this work. Okay, so I hope that um, I gave you an, ov an overview of the model and what we can uh, discuss. Mm, now, let me... Mm, First, fix again the kind of dynamic that we that we discuss, <laughs> that we use, is the Glauber dynamic. So, uh, spins can only flip. So, um, at each step, so imagine that now your uh, configuration sigma is a Markov uh, chain, um, and then uh, this continuous time Markov chain uh, is such that you go from a configuration sigma to a configuration sigma prime, where you have flip only one spin with a certain rate, which is exponential of minus beta times the positive part of the difference of the Hamiltonian, so the new Hamiltonian minus the old Hamiltonian, positive part, where beta is the inverse temperature. And um, the, the Gibbs measure, defined as E2 minus beta, uh, the Hamiltonian, is the invariant measure for this uh, Markov chain, is our equilibrium measure. Um, so now let's start this dynamic on, on, the, on this uh, um, quenched model. And now the natural questions are the following. Suppose that you know that the annealed model is metastable. What can you say about metastability for the quenched model? Is that metastable? Yes or no? On the same set? Yes or no? Second question is, again, uh, this kind of mean heating times. But because we are working uh, with the potential theory, we are starting from uh, um, a configuration sigma, which is drawn with respect to uh, a complicated measure, which is called last exit bias distribution. To make it simple, suppose that A is a singleton. This would be just the indicator of the set A when it's a singleton, but in general it's not a singleton. So in general you will start according to this uh, measure, which is biased with respect to the last exit time from the set A in the transition to B. Okay, that's, um, sorry? What is mu is that? Mu is the equilibrium measure, the Gibbs measure. Um, okay, now I'm going to show you two kind of results. There are going to be some tail behavior of the distribution of this mean heating time, because the mean heating time is still random. Everything is still random. You, even if you see expectations, it's are still random. And then uh, some uh, uh, moment uh, estimates. And again, all the results will be quenched in the two random variables A and P. <coughs> okay, so now another technical slide. I apologize for, for the technicality, but I need it. Um, so up to here, I've just uh, said uh, a little bit what it means to be meta for a system to be metastable, but I di didn't, didn't give you the exact mathematical definition that we are going to work with, which is this one. So now consider a simple case where you have a set of metastable points. So um, So you have, uh, I don't know, an easy example, M1, M2, M3. Okay, so um, which are your minima of the free energy. Now, um, you, you, we say that the, the Markov process is raw metastable if this ratio is small. Now, what is this ratio? Um, to avoid technicalities, so the, the numerator indicates 
the probability that I start from one of these minima and I go first to, the, to another minima before going back to the first minima. This should be small, right? And indeed, it's small if you compare it with, uh, with the probability that I start from any point, any subset, actually, A, and I go to one of the minima before going back to A. So this ratio, which is, uh, in a sense, representing of what we have said many times this morning, should be small, should be smaller than some row, which is small in n, like exponential of uh, minus n order. Okay, um, this is our definition. And now the assumption. Uh, you don't have to read all the details of this assumption. The assumption is simply that the annealed model is raw metastable with respect to the definition that I just gave you, okay, with, with this uh, constant. Assume that, that this is true. Then the, ther the theorem says that also the quench model is raw metastable with the same set of metastable points. This is nice. Uh, you have to pay a small price in the, um, in the row. Uh, it's going to be raw metastable with another row. But the sets are the same. And the second theorem is, um, Okay, now fix A, one of the minima, and take B to be any lower minima. Then the, you want to compare the mean heating time with the, of the quench model with the mean heating time of the annealed model. In what sense? In the sense that their ratio, which is random, has the following tails. This ratio is, uh, um, uh, is actually the exponential of a random variable which is sub-Gaussian. Hmm? Okay, so this, you have sub-Gaussian tails. So this is uh, a tail-bound kind of estimate. Um, and it's, it's quite precise because we can uh, uh, also, also um, compute explicitly the constants. Uh, C bar is going to depend on these bounds on the, on the, on the random variables and Alpha, alpha appearing here, depends on the variance of the random variable, B, okay? And on the parameters of the, of the model as well. Okay, so um, this is the first kind of result. Huh? You compare the mean heating time for the quench model with those of the annealed model. One thing, they always think that you know the annealed model and you want to to uh, go um, one step higher in terms of randomness and then you compare these two min minuting times. Third result, how much time do I have? Three minutes, okay, I will uh, finish. Uh, third result is that we can also compare any moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you take any moment of this random variable, this is going to be uh, close to the mean heating time of the annealed model and we have upper and lower bounds for that. So metastability, uh, tail estimates, moment estimates, these are the kind of results in order to describe the mean heating time, which is a random object of this quench model. Um, okay, I, I, this is my last slide then before. <laughs> so um, I just want to, to say one word about the strategy now. Um, so if you, if you uh, say, if you want to, to find some bounds for this object, so you have the log of uh, this expectation minus the same thing, but for the annealed model, when I, I talk about the annealed model, I have tilde to Okay, so the trick is that we add and subtract the expectation of the log. And now we have two steps. Step one, we want to, uh, to, to bound this object to the log of this. 
minus the expectation of the log of the same thing. And this is nine can be nicely bounded via concentrations because you have concentration inequalities because you have a function minus its average, and this function has nice property like it's a Lipschitz and so on. And the second step instead is the annealed estimates. And now you have to compare the expectation of the log with the log of the annealed uh, thing. And this is a bit harder. Um, okay, so this is the strategy. Uh, this plus potential theory is the strategy which we use to um, to, to solve uh, uh, our main, uh, main problem. So uh, let me conclude by saying that there is one related problem I'm working with at the moment with uh, Johan Dubeldam, Vicente Lenz, and uh, Martin Slovic, which instead deal with the dilute versions of the POTS model, where you have, uh, say, Q colors. Uh, each spin uh, cannot, can be not only plus or minus, but has, can have Q colors. And then my free energy has uh, uh, similar behavior uh, as in the previous talk uh, with uh, different uh, minima and, uh, and it's, it's more complicated, of course. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. What condition on uh, A, I, J? Um, it depends. So, um, for instance, in the case of uh, Opfield, metastability has been studied by Underheiden, but for specific, for actually a small uh, parameter range. So, I, I don't know a general what is a, what could be a general. Uh, uh, property of the AIJ which assure, ensure you that you have a metastability. This is a very hard question to answer. But um, this is a general result that tells you, you give me a model which you can study, I add some uh, uh, randomness which means, means say, erasing links which can be, could be for maybe for uh, machine learning people could be uh, maybe uh, more convenient to have less interactions. Or uh, you could have, uh, say, uh, yeah, so a random graph. Or you could have uh, something diluted, uh, like uh, in the spin glass sense. But uh, um, your question is, again, uh, what can we say in general on uh, metastability for uh, any spin system? And, and it depends. Yeah. OK, let's thanks again, uh, <laughs> Elena.